In our last study together in Exodus chapter 19 and 20, we saw God establishing a relationship with Israel. It was a process. Uh, first of all, he wanted them to understand uh, what he wanted, and that was a kingdom of priests, a holy people unto himself. Uh, he, secondly, he wanted the people to understand who he was, a holy God, and none like him, alone in majesty. Thirdly, he wanted the people to understand what he expected of them, and so he gives them the law to show them that they are an unholy people, which is the fourth thing he wanted them to recognize, that he was holy and they were not. They were separate from him. They couldn't come into his presence. And then fifthly, he shows them the provision of mercy, the provision of uh, atoning blood, which would allow them to come as close to him as possible. Now in Exodus chapter 21, um, we have God laying forth uh, with Moses, I believe this is still his fourth trip up on the mount, um, constraints for the people to follow in their interaction with each other. He's putting in order the society of holy priests that he wants to follow him. How should they behave before a holy God? It's quite ironic that in chapter 21, verse 1, he starts out, the Lord starts out by uh, putting constraints on slavery. It's ironic in that all the men, women, and children of the Israelites have been liberated from Egypt. There aren't any slaves among them, and yet that's where the Lord begins in giving these constraints and laws, provisions for this holy nation he wants before him. Clearly, God knew the heart of man, and the depravity of man comes out in time, and no doubt Israel would want to enslave their fellow countrymen at some point in the future. And so it was necessary to have constraints on slavery. It's not a prohibition against slavery. Uh, we really don't find that in Scripture. Um, it's very, uh, what God is saying is, I know what you'll do, I know who you are, and I'm, I'm putting constraints on it so it doesn't get out of control. He's not endorsing slavery, uh, but he doesn't prohibit it either. It's my opinion that the reason that God begins with these laws on slavery and service is to better reflect what he expects Israel's attitude to be towards him. And so we pick up now in Exodus 21, verse 1. Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she has bore him sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to the judges, he shall also bring him to the door, or the doorpost of his master shall pierce his ear, with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Verse 6 again, Then his master shall bring him to the judges, he shall also bring him to the door, or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Under Levitical law, a Jew could not enslave another Jew more than six years. Sometimes Jews, if they had uh, been convicted of a felony, uh, some wrong, they could work off the penalty through uh, service, being enslaved for a period of time. Uh, sometimes uh, people sold themselves into slavery if they got into debt. In order to pay the debt, they would agree to serve so many years. Jews could have Gentile slaves as long as they wanted, but for a fellow countryman, they were to be set free after six years, or later when the year of Jubilee came into place, they would be released then as well. 
And so the Hebrew servant that is served six years, when that six years is up, he has a choice. He can go out free for nothing. In other words, he can be liberated after that six years, but he goes out for nothing. He has nothing with him. He just has himself. Or he can say, you know, life with my master these last six years has been wonderful. I can't imagine life without him and serving him. I'm going to agree to serve him my whole life. Now, if he was married uh, and had children, um, the scripture also addresses that. They would stay with him if he chose to remain uh, in service to his master. But if he chose not to remain, uh, he would go out without his wife and children. They remained with the master. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. The Lord Jesus um, often taught about discipleship. Normally he would mention the Gospel message first, because you have to be saved, you have to be born again before you can become a disciple of Christ. And then he would start speaking about discipleship. And we have that progression in Luke chapter 9. In verse 22, he speaks of the gospel message. He's speaking to his disciples and he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the third day. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. You have to deny yourself to follow. You have to forsake to follow. And what the Lord was saying here is he just didn't want a large quantity of disciples. He wanted quality. He wanted people that would be sold out for him. And so they would have to deny their thoughts about what life would be and what would make them happy and take on the Lord's will. What would make the Lord's happy uh, in day-to-day -day life? What would please the Lord? And to take up one's cross daily. A cross was a symbol of death and shame. If you saw a friend bearing a cross beam in Roman days, um, that just meant one thing. They were headed to a public place of execution. Uh, their daytime planner was, was cleared for the next week. It was all over. It was a symbol of death and shame. And so when we bear um, our cross for Christ, what we're saying is, I'm willing to take uh, the shame that was associated with Christ on his cross. I'm willing to crucify my own hands. Uh, when your hands are nailed to uh, a cross beam, you can't grab anything. And so it was a symbol, basically, of shame and complete, uh, being completely given over to a cause. That's really the idea of commitment here that uh, is being addressed to us in Exodus 21 with the, the slave who says, I'm going to remain with my master after six years. I will not go out free for nothing. He had a choice. He could go out free, but he would have nothing if he did. Rather, he would... He chose to live with his master for the rest of his life and enjoy a life that would be pleasing to his master. Commitment is being given over to a cause without reservation. And that means unwavering obedience and devotion. And that's what the Lord wanted in his disciples. So the disciple had to deny himself what he wanted in life, his will. He had to take up his cross, bearing the shame of the cross. Uh, having hands nailed to the beam that can't grab the things that we wanted to and follow the Lord, um, obeying him. And if we do that, the Lord goes on in Luke 9, 24, he says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains a whole world and himself destroyed or lost? What profit is there to go free out free for nothing? You could have liber liberation from your master, but then it doesn't count for anything. You don't have anything to show for it. 
And so the Lord is telling us to find purpose in life is by being yielded to and being yoked to him, experiencing him, going on, living out his life, not our own life. We come to the cross of Christ for salvation, and then we uh, go on from the cross with our own cross, uh, representing the Lord's cross in all that we do. Luke chapter 14. The Lord again uh, addresses the subject matter of discipleship. And again, we have the pattern of him first speaking of the gospel message that's given in the pattern of a parable. He has the parable of the Great Supper in Luke 14, verses 15 through 24. Invitation to come and eat all that you wanted. Um, and we have a, a wonderful um, glimpse here that God wants his home, his mansions, his abode full of saved sinners. And so the invitation goes out. Some made excuses about um, their careers or jobs, uh, materialism, relationships, and they wouldn't come. And the Lord says, well, go out to the byways, the highways. I want my house to be full. And so we, we see the heart of God in wanting to compel sinners to yield to his message, his invitation, that they can spend eternity with him. Of course, everybody liked this message. Who doesn't want to eat a big feast? Who doesn't want to be invited by the, the king to uh, have fellowship and communion and eat all, all that you would want? And so it says, a great multitude followed the Lord. In verse 25, but the Lord knew the hearts of those who were following him, and he wasn't seeking a large congregation to follow him. He just wanted quality believers uh, given over to him in full commitment. So he says, if anyone comes to me, in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Of course, we have the parallel passage in Matthew 10, in verse 37, and there um, the same thing is stated, but it's mentioned in love. If anyone loves these other relationships more than me, then he can't be my disciple. So we understand that hate here in verse 26 is the comparative term. Our love for the Lord must be so outstanding that all other relationships are a distant second. And that's what he wants. That's what it means to have Christ as our first love. And whosoever does not bear my cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In verse 23 he says, So likewise, whosoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Lord Jesus never spoke about um, becoming a disciple. When you trust the gospel message of Jesus Christ and you're born again, you become a child of God. Disciple, mathetas, is a Greek word. It means to be a learner. And that's what a disciple is. It's true that a disciple follows the Lord, but that's just one aspect of discipleship. The idea of discipleship is learning. We're learning a person. And the Lord mentions this in Matthew chapter 10. He talks about his disciples learning of him. And then chapter 11, he tells them uh, what he's like. I think it's the only verse in the New Testament where the Lord tells us something about himself at the end of chapter 11. He says, I'm meek and lowly in heart. And he invites them to learn of him. And the only way we can learn of him is to be yoked with him. If we walk ahead of the Lord and behind the Lord, we're going to create work for ourselves. But if we're walking in step with the Lord, yoked with him, he does all the work, he carries us along, and life is joyful, peaceful, and fruitful. And so this is what the Lord was trying to tell his disciples. You must be my disciple. It's an active, ongoing relationship with the Lord. Becoming has the idea that uh, I've arrived, I've hit a plateau. If I say to you, I have become a father, it, it's the idea that there's been a son or daughter born to me and I'm now a father and I've arrived so to speak I'll always be a father 
But the idea of discipleship is a being reality. It's an ongoing act of reality. It's not just achieving some measure of um, status or success. It's realizing that our entire life is given to Christ and we go on with him. And so he says we must bear our own cross. He must be our first love. We must forsake to follow. Uh, when we do these things, then we get a life uh, which counts for something. Uh, we're saying just like the, the Jewish slave, I will not go out free for nothing. I realize that my master loves me. Life has been good with him. I must go on with him. And in doing so, I get a life that, that counts. And so, just as the Lord Jesus punctuated this in his own ministry among his disciples, this is, I think, likely why uh, Jehovah God mentions this first among his uh, laws guiding relationships within the society, is that they might understand um, that he really wanted them to be sold out for him. Uh, totally committed to him, given over to a cause without reservation to him. Then they would be a peculiar people. Then their lives would count for something. So the challenge for us here is to say, I will not go out free for nothing. I, I will choose to go on with the Lord and experience a life which counts for something. There was a godly man, a preacher in, in England, named F.B. Mayer, um, during the latter part of the 20th century. Um, sorry, the latter part of the 19th century into the 20th century. Um, when F.B. Mayer was in his early 60s, uh, he experienced burnout. And there was a a wealthy merchant man named Lord Inverclyde who invited F.B. Mayer to come to his estate. It was a luxurious estate, had a number of acres of uh, forest and so forth uh, uh, associated with the mansion. And he invited this burned out preacher to come and just rest at his estate and recover. And F.B. Mayer um, took Lord Inverclyde up on that invitation. He was 61, 62 years of age. This would have been around uh, 1909, 1910. And after a few weeks, F.B. Mayer um, felt that he had been rusted. He was one morning out uh, taking a stroll through the estate and he actually met Lord Inverclyde among the trees and Lord Inverclyde asked his guest how he was doing, and he said that he was doing so much better and, and thanked uh, his host for showing such gracious hospitality. Lord Inverclyde said, well, if I was really a good host, I would show you my most prized possession. Would you like to see it? And F.B. Mayer said, I would. So the two men uh, walked together through the woods. Uh, they made a turn, and there in a clearing was a full-scale African mud hut. And this was in England, so it was quite a sight. And so Lord Inverclyde uh, told the story of how this hut came to be on his estate. Uh, when David Livingston died in 1873, he was a pioneer missionary in Africa, uh, traveled tens of thousands of miles through the interior of Africa, going where no white man had been before, taking the gospel uh, to these tribes. He wanted to see a, a slavery abolished. Uh, he was mapping out the territory, um, but he was sharing the gospel from village to village. And uh, he died in Africa, and uh, over the course of the following months, some of the uh, natives from Africa uh, brought the body of David Livingston back to England. He was buried at Westminster Abbey. And then some of these um, Christians from Africa uh, were invited to uh, Lord Inverclyde's estate um, after the, the funeral, before they went back to Africa. And uh, can you imagine this rich um, Englishman and um, 
these folks from the jungles of Africa. Uh, it was quite a contrast, and but these um, Christians from Africa were were really thankful for their hosts' uh, hospitality, and they asked what they could do in order to uh, repay or give some kind of a blessing back to Lord Inverclyde. And Lord Inverclyde said, well, "What, you know, what could I ask these?" Uh, humble people, these lowly people, for, and that he thought, uh, I would like you to build me a full-scale replica of the hut that David Livingston lived in. And they were excited to do that. So these African Christians, they cut down trees on the estate, and they uh, erected this full African mud hut on this uh, English estate. And they also made the furniture that David Livingston had in his hut, which consisted of a bed, uh, a small table, and a chair. After the two men talked for a while, uh, Lord Inverclyde left F.B. Mayer to his thoughts, and F.B. Mayer uh, decided to look inside the mud hut. So he walked to the hut, and he went through the door and as he looked around at the simple uh, existence of this great man of God, David Livingston, um, he was overwhelmed with conviction. And he got down on his knees on the, before the bed that had been put in this hut, the bed of David Livingston. And F.B. Mayer wept before the Lord and said, Oh Lord, please forgive me. I've been a half-hearted Christian. I've not been sold out for you. And he said, Lord, if you will give me my best years ahead, I will serve you with my whole heart. Now, 20 years later, F.B. Mayer, in a message, was uh, recounting the story. He was now at 81 years of age, and he told his audience, he said, the Lord answered that prayer. He said, the last 20 years have been the best years of my life. I have been totally committed to the Lord, and he has blessed me with joy and fruitfulness. And he wouldn't trade them for anything else in the world. And shortly after that, he was almost 82. He died in 1929. Um, and so the Lord um, blessed that prayer. And the Lord always blesses the prayers of his people when they are sold out for him. It's what the Lord wanted. Sometimes we go through life uh, half-hearted. We're trying to do things in our own strength, and the Lord knows our heart all along. And until we come to a point of utter desperation for the Lord, when we come to the point of like the Jewish servant who says, I love my master, I can't think of a better life than serving him, for the rest of my life, I will not go out free for nothing. I will serve him forever. And when we have that type of mentality, that kind of disposition towards the Lord, that type of commitment, that's when the Lord really uses us. So may we also have this mentality of being a disciple of Christ, learning our master and being given over to him. Father, please help us with these things. We want to be sold out Christians uh, for the Lord Jesus. We want to um, serve him with our full capacity. Father, if he's not our first love, convict us that he might be our first love. If we're not forsaking so that we can follow, please convict us of that. If we're esteeming other things better than him, convict us of that. If we're not bearing our own cross, Lord, please show us that. Lord, whatever it is that's holding us back, <clears throat> we pray that you would just uh, show it to us, that we might come clean. And uh, just like F.B. Mayer, we might uh, have our best years ahead of us. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.